So, um, welcome everybody to the, the latest in this um, series of talks. And I, before settling or deciding what to talk about, um, I had a look at the titles that had gone before and remembered, looked back to those talks. And at least one of the words that hadn't occurred in a title was the word chanting. So this seemed a, this was a chance to, uh, as you were, add that one to the pile, uh, to the list. Though of course, um, in the course of the of, of the talks, a number of people have referred to chanting in one way or another. Um, to think of just a few, I know that Paul referred to chanting in at least one of his Yoga Vachara talks, and Peter was characteristically creative in his use of the it to be so in his talk and uh, I think Valerie referred to the chanting of the of the Metta Sutta just to name but three and in a way that that says something about the place of chanting in in our tradition in Samatha so it's a sort of part of a broader mix of things often not centre stage but giving support to the meditation practice, support to other things, just as they, in, the, in their own way, support the chanting. So for most of us, we, our first contact with Samatha is either through a meditation class, or if not that, then we come to a meditation class reasonably shortly after that. So in my case it was meditation by a short head, by which I mean that uh, the University Society at Manchester in those days ran alongside the meditation class. There was a series of talks about all different aspects of, of Buddhism. Uh, so those two went quite nicely together I found. Actually if we look historically I would say it's probably relatively unusual to make a first contact with the teachings of the Buddha through a meditation class. If we think back over the centuries to, in particular to all those people who've grown up in a culture where, where Buddhism was a kind of established part of the landscape, then that would certainly have been very unusual. Actually, it would have been more likely that the first contact would have been through chanting. But um, in this part of the world and at this particular time, it's, as the saying goes, quite normal for, for the first contact to be through a meditation class. And we, we, talk, we talk about meditation practice. And so this word practice comes to be endowed with a sense of a particular focus on, on the activity of meditation. But um, after a while, it may be that we find it helpful to kind of expand our, our interests, our activities. And we may find it helpful to engage in a variety of other things. For example, for some people it's it's theory work of some kind, um, you know, looking at some sort of structures, some sort of external frame of reference to which we can apply our experience in the practice and also provide a vehicle for um, making that available to others. For others, it may be some sort of physical work, either a martial art or something like that, or, or just applying ourselves in a particular way to the, to, for example, the activity of looking after our centers, you know, tidying things, cleaning things, mending things, building things, digging things, all sorts of things, physical things. And chanting is another one of those other things that we come to engage in, in relation to the meditation practice. My, my, favorite image for this is is a, a memory from childhood which is um going going down to the beach with a bucket and spade 
And well, what do you do with a bucket and a spade on the beach? Of course, you start to dig a hole. Um, and our, our, our favorite technique was to, to draw a little circle on the beach and then you start digging down the hole, you see. But fairly shortly, you find you can't actually go any further. You can't, you can't get any deeper because there's no kind of room for maneuver. The spade gets stuck. So what you have to do is to take the spade out and then draw a wider circle and then start digging again and then go down. I remember my uh, sort of the childish mind was very resistant to taking the spade out and no this is going in the wrong direction we want to go down but actually sometimes you need you need more breadth in order to achieve more depth. So we need to take as it were, to kind of encompass more raw material into what we are conceiving of as, as, as practice. And so this is, this is where chanting sits in the sort of, should we say, the broader firmament of, of what is Samatha. It's, it's a full range of things which support the meditation practice. The meditation practice remains at the heart, but it's both supported by these things and also the meditation practice supports them as well. Uh, I think in the case of chanting, this is, it has a particular, um, it's particularly close to the meditation practice in, in, in a number of respects. In the meditation practice, we talk about, you know, we start off talking about mindfulness and concentration, and we try and develop these two things in balance. And in chanting practice, we don't use these terms at all. On the other hand, if we take the, the actual process of chanting, and particularly if we're chanting from, from memory, so on the one hand, we have the, the content, the, the words, and we have to pay attention to the words with a particular quality of attention so that we, we're sufficiently attentive to the words so that they keep coming in the right with a sort of flow. And and there's very much a sort of balance in that. If you try and grasp onto each word and sort of think it through beforehand, then, then you will soon get lost, you'll stumble. You have to keep a quite a light touch to let that sort of, it's like a thread running through your hand. You have to, the hand has to be there to guide it all the time. But equally, if you grasp it too firmly, then it will snap and then you'll, you'll be lost. You have to start again. So getting that right quality of attention is, is very important to letting the chanting flow. And we could call that concentration, but we don't tend to think of it. So the chanting has its own sort of language, its own approach. So we don't actually use the same label. In the same way, we talk about when you're chanting in a group, needing to pay attention to the others, other people around you. So what, what sort of um, paying attention to the to the to the sound which is set by others to the volume so you're not louder than the loudest you're not you're you're um, you're sort of in the middle range as it were so you're needing to have a balance of attention again we don't we don't necessarily talk about that as mindfulness but actually even though we're not um, even though we're not using these familiar labels in fact, that's, we're just developing the same things. So the fact that we're not using a particular set of labels doesn't mean that we're not developing the actual qualities, the actual qualities of mindfulness and concentration, just because we're not referring to them in those terms. And actually sometimes in practice, it's very helpful to, um, particularly if we tend to get a little bit over-focused, it's quite helpful to work on something a little more obliquely um, a little less deliberately, you may find that developing that actually mindfulness and concentration develop rather more easily if you're not if you're not sort of focused on them in that way. Um, so you might say, well, I'm I'm doing the I'm doing the meditation practice and I'm I'm trying to develop mindfulness and concentration. And, oh, by the way, I'm doing this chanting thing on the side, and I sort of when I'm trying to keep the chanting going and pay attention to other people. And actually that slightly lighter attention that you're paying to the thing that you think is not your main object, actually that may be developing more actual, more actual mindfulness and more actual concentration. So sometimes the things that we're doing sort of at the side 
have a little bit more freedom to actually develop the qualities themselves, even if we're not um, so focused on them. Anyway, that's something of the, of the sort of context in which we find chanting within our, within our practice, within, within our kind of tradition of practice. But if we want to, if we want to look back at some of the, the kind of roots or the origins of, of Pali chanting, we can look back. We need to, as it were, do a little bit of time travel. So we should take ourselves back to uh, ooh, nearly two and a half thousand years to uh, a place in northern India. And this is at the time of uh, someone who's around at that time, um, who in their early days, uh, they, they have a, a personal name, just like you and me. But subsequently, they come to be known not by not with reference to who they were, but by what they were or what they did. And what they did is expressed or encapsulated in the Pali word Bodhi, waking up. And so we refer to the person, this person as the Buddha, the one who woke up. And in fact, when we, when we chant the Itipi So chant, we refer to him not just as the Buddha, but as the Sama Sambuddha, the fully, perfectly awakened one. And this incorporates a slightly broader notion. So unlike what known as the Pacheka Buddha, who, who makes the same discovery, but is not able to, as it were, take it further than that, the, the Samasam Buddha, having discovered, then makes that same teaching available to others, as we know, through providing the path. So the Buddha, um, the tradition has it that after the awakening, the Buddha carries on teaching for some 45 years. And it said that shortly after that time, there was a great gathering of, uh, of, of arahats to, to consider how to, how to take forward this, this body of, of teaching. But actually, um, this must surely have been something that people were considering long before that, even right from the start. You know, how, how to respond to this, how to take it forward, how to, um, you know, remember it and so on. And this is not just a historical thing. This is something that we, that we all encounter much of the time. So, uh, you know, when you go to a class, how do you absorb that? How do you... Um, make sure that it's just not something that's here today, gone tomorrow. I remember a story from the, one of the early classes that Nye Booman took at, in, at Green Street. And there surely must have been a, a, a live issue. And on that week, somebody started writing some notes and this gave rise to some discussion. Is this a good thing to do? Is this not a good thing to do? And somebody asked Nye Booman, what did he think? So on that, on that occasion, his response was, well, for the person who's doing the writing, it may take them longer to understand. On the other hand, in the longer term, uh, it will surely be of benefit to more people. So anyway, that's what he said on that occasion, <laughs> maybe to a different group, he would have answered differently. But actually that's a useful point at which to, to mark up one of the key differences between conditions that we find ourselves in now and conditions that were pertaining at the time of the Buddha. Because in the example, the person concerned was writing some notes. But at the time of the Buddha, there was no writing. No writing in India at that time. Oh, that's a fairly easy thing just to 
as it were, slip off the tongue. Okay, so there was no writing. But actually, just think about that. Can you imagine what it'd be like to have no writing? Something that we're so, so dependent on. That's quite a, quite a thing to, to imagine. Thinking about that, I, I found that the, the process of sort of trying to get to grips with that was, was in, sort of came in two phases. And the first phase was to do with what it was like to be without something something that we're on which we're so dependent we rely on for so much but of course if you've never had any experience of that and there's no 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 real concept of that then i guess it's not doesn't really arise like that it's just an absence of something and that must also affect interesting it must also affect the sort of balance between your senses and for example, sometimes it's quite interesting to consider um, which of the, whether you pay more attention to sight or to sound, which, which is more, which do you find is the dominant sense. And then try and spend a bit of time paying attention to the other one, deliberately paying attention to the other one. That's quite an interesting thing to do. But it would, in any, in any event, it may have um, certainly affected kind of experience, people's experience of daily life. And it would also mean that there were all sorts of other skills that were much more um, sort of heightened. For example, the skill of memorization must have been a much more um, developed skill in those times. Whereas today we have, you know, with different technologies and different interests, we have different skills, but that particular skill is not not so not so developed as it was in those in those it must have been in those times so before we look at how how that body of teaching was taken forward let's let's just look at briefly at some of what it says about the teaching itself what, what do the suttas say so if we look at you know, so many of the suttas as we know, so how do they start? They, they start with a simple Pali phrase, ewa me sutang, thus have I heard, heard, not seen, read, something heard. And then uh, after sort of describing the context and where the Buddha was and in whose company and so on, then quite often you have another phrase which is, um, Bhagawa Etada Vircha. So the, the Blessed One spoke thus, or this is what the Buddha said. But I'm going to pause on a very, very basic point. This is what he said. He spoke. Now, um, the Buddha was, I suppose one could say, supremely creative. And if you think of all the different ways that he responded to so many different people and gave so many different teachings. Um, and sometimes, you know, I have two memories from, from Samatha of uh, of a rather different approach. So I remember in one group, for example, that, um, where we had to, to look at some material and uh, come back and report on, on what we discovered the next week. So, so one person um, managed to write a song. So their, their contribution was sung. And on another occasion, someone gave what was probably one of the most eloquent talks I've ever heard without actually uttering a single word, but simply operating through the blackboard and through, um, I seem to remember it had involved something like drawing the different stages of a hangman, you know, the, the game, and then rubbing them out again, one by one, something like that. Anyway, it was a very skillful performance. However, For all the um, inherent sort of creativity in the way that the Buddha responded to, to, to different situations, we can we can say that very simply, the teachings were broadly spoken. So this is a very basic point. Until you think that actually, if you look at the way that these teachings have been carried down the centuries, actually the vehicle for that was not through speaking 
but through chanting. Because what was set up was a, a body of material that was chanted and passed on that way. Now, the way that that was used, of course, when we, when we work from the, the suttas, of course, then we, when we give Dhamma talks or listen to Dhamma talks, then people, then we, we can speak based on that. But the actual way that that body of material was transmitted was not through the vehicle through which it was originally delivered, through speaking, but actually through chanting. So we might ask, well, why? Well, I'm certainly not going to try and uh, give a definitive answer to that, but we may try and explore um, some reasons why that might be the case, or you might like to present some later on, present your own thoughts on that. But to, to, to start us off on that, I'd like to, if you'd be good enough to, to join me in a little exercise. This is um, slightly, um, subject to the vagaries of zoom but we'll let's see, we'll see if this works so i'd like to take a very a very short piece of pali three words we said um we said how the sutta start a one me sutang thus have i heard now to begin with i'm just going to say it i'm just going to say it a couple of times a one me sutang and by the way, in the best tradition of, uh, of oral culture, uh, I'm not going to give it, I'm not going to put it on the blackboard for something to, for you to read. So if you could just try and listen to it and hear what, what we're trying to repeat, okay? So just listen, first of all. E wam me sutang. Okay? And again. E wam me sutang. So now I'm going to say it again. And this time, could you try and join in? Again, just in this, the spoken voice. Just try and join in. Repeat it with me. E wam me sutang. Okay. Again. E wam me sutang. Good. I've plenty of lip movement visible, even though I can't hear you, unfortunately. But good. So um, anyway, just to pr prove it wasn't a flu, could you just try it a couple of times on your own? Okay. Right. So now we're going to take the same thing and we're going to chant it. Okay, so I'll, I'll do it to begin with, just to listen, listen the first couple of times. E wa me sutang. E wa me sutang. Okay, now we'll try it together. E wa me sutang. Together again. E wa me sutang. Okay, good. Now, this time we're going to do it spoken. We're going to go back to doing it spoken this time. But when we do it, now that it's, you don't have to think too much about what you're doing. We can just do it. This time, just pay a little attention to what's, to the actual production of that sound. What's actually going on in the mouth and round about the throat and anywhere else in the body that you've, where do you experience that, the production of that sound in the body when we're just speaking it? Okay, we'll try it again, just together. E wam me sutang. And again. E wam me sutang. Just say it a few times just to get the sense of that. E wam me sutang. Okay. Right, so now we're going to try it again and chant it. But this time also try and be aware of how you experience that in the body. Is it the same or is it different? E wa me sutang. E wa me sutang. E wa me sutang. Okay. Well, I think rather than breaking off for a discussion at this point, perhaps leave any thoughts you have on that perhaps to the end. But it would be very interesting to hear how you got on with that. But for me, it seems, the chanting seems to be more literally embodied. And that, I think, for me anyway, it certainly, it certainly helps to to somehow to sort of embed things. But anyway, that would be an interesting thing to talk about later, but as to how you, how you found that. 
I suppose there are a couple of other things that essentially what you need if you're going to to provide a vehicle for um, for preserving and for taking forward a very large amount of material. First of all, you need you need something you need a, a technique that is well suited to memorization. And so it needs to be kind of structured in some way. And perhaps also have a, um, a sort of feeling quality about it as well. So if we look at, if we just look at that very simple piece of chanting, e wame so tang. So the way that we do that, we can actually specify for each syllable in a way that I think is rather easier to do than if than in the in a just a normal spoken voice. We we can actually break it down. We can specify um, for each syllable. We can say this is a long syllable or a short syllable, and we can specify a particular note even for chanting. So bum 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 e wan me su dang. Okay, so we can actually help to embed a particular sound in each syllable. And we can say that, uh, you know, each syllable is long and short, and we can, uh, and it help, that helps us to, to give it a particular form, which is more easily memorized. And that's how the chanting, um, I think that's one of the strengths of the chanting. It, it also provides... Um, the, the, the different uh, types of syllable provide different qualities of sound as well. So, again, very simply, what's the, probably the first thing we ever chant? is probably nut more, that one word. So nut more has two syllables, nut more, okay? And the first one is a short syllable, so it's quite clip, nut, 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 pa, 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 pa. So there is a particular quality to that. And there's a very different quality to more, a sort of long, some of you can feel it resonating in the chest sometimes, more. So a very different, very different quality. You might even say that that sort of nut, that clipped quality of the, of the short syllable has a quality a bit like sort of walking outside on a bright winter morning. There's a sort of slight, mm, Slight shock, slight intake of breath. Na, 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 pa, pa, pa. Whereas the more is a more, a deeper resonating sound. And we can say in a very broad sense that, that the nut, that clipped quality, inclines to the side of waking up. Whereas the the more the deeper resonating quality in, in, inclines to the side of, you can say, of samatha, if you like. So just in that one word, we, we sort of have a, we can, we have something which encapsulates something of the quality of both sides of the practice in that way. So, the chanting is, in that way, the, by, by using these techniques, the, the, the chanting has um, provided a vehicle whereby something can be taken forward. And in fact, taken forward very, um, very successfully. So now if we, if we move forward several centuries, of course, if we look to the different countries where um, where the Buddha's teaching has taken root, and certainly Theravada, um, if we're talking about Pali chanting. So now we know that that there are there are you know different different traditions of Pali chanting. So there is a Thai tradition, a Cambodian tradition, Sri Lankan tradition, and uh, and the Burmese tradition. Unfortunately, over the years, we've we've managed to meet meet people from all of those traditions. Um, who've, who've taught us some chants and we, it's actually we've we've always made it our practice to 
try to uh, to learn the, the chant as closely to the way that it's been uh, chanted in that tradition rather than trying to reduce everything to a single way of, of doing things in order to, to preserve something of the sort of richness of possibilities of, of, of the chant. So I think the one important thing to note there is that those, those traditions of, ch of chanting have developed over many centuries. Going back to the time of the Buddha, they they developed um, there were people called barnakas who or reciters, and in fact they long preceded the the Buddhist tradition of Pali chanting. So there were in the sort of environment of the time there were there were there was a very well established tradition of reciting of Brahmins reciting the ancient Sanskrit texts and so on. So that was also a natural thing to turn to, uh, because it, there was already a well-established tradition of, of, of reciting texts and memorizing texts. And that, actually that tradition um, continues right up to the present day. So in, in, in Burma, for example, there is a, every year they have a, uh, an event where people can, who have been trying to, to learn the, um, learn to memorize the, the suttas, they, um, there is a, this annual event where people can come and and demonstrate their um, their skills, and they're tested. And if you, uh, there are some people who have tried to learn, say, the whole of the Sutta Pitaka and some all of the Abhidhamma and so on. And, and a few people even have attempted to memorize the entire Pali Canon. And they're they're tested, and they have to they don't have to recite the whole thing, but they're um, they um, they're given a series of of um, a, a selection of uh, passages, probably about 20 minutes each, and they have to do a number of these. And they have, uh, they sit at a, a, sort of a little table and the, there are two people either side and one in front, and the, the ones either side are following carefully the, the, the text to make sure they don't make any mistakes. And they're allowed up to, th I think they're allowed three, three errors. And after that, then they're, they're not, not passed. Um, but there are still, um, a small number of, of people who are each year who are recognized as, as being able to chant the whole of the Pali Canon, which is an extraordinary, rather extraordinary feat, if you, um, and something really beyond our, um, beyond our imagination, really. Um, but having said that, actually, even probably a hundred years or so ago, it was still uh, co quite commonplace for for people to know um, very extensive passages of the Bible and so on and, and that. So <clears throat> these are not skills that we've never had, but it's just that we've they've gradually fallen into bands and other skills and techniques have, have taken their place. So if we think of that um, process going on, um, the process of, of local styles of chanting developing over centuries in these different countries. So what are things in this part of the world? So here things have been going a much, much, much shorter time. So if we think of the sort of time span whereby people may have gradually come to know the Pali texts, um, so when would that start? Well, I suppose a key moment in that would be the Pali text at the foundation of the Pali Text Society, which which sort of helped to make the text available. So that that Pali Text Society was founded in 1881. Um, in terms of people becoming ordained, so the first couple of instances of that were, I think, right at the end of the 19th century. Um, there was an English chap called Alan Bennett, who ordained in Sri Lanka in, in 1898 and then there was a it was an Irish chap actually less well known called um, Lawrence Carroll he ordained in Burma in I think 1900 so a beginning of that and the Buddhist Society in London started in 1907 so I think we can say that really the sort of familiarity with the texts has been going scarcely more than 100 years 
and probably a serious uh, any sort of attempt to, to engage with the or widespread attempt to engage with the chanting probably half that so this is very early days very early days and I think there's a very um, there's an interesting balance between we've we've paid in the way that we've kind of approached and tried to learn the chanting we've we've tried to follow very closely the particular way that particular chants have been taught to us but inevitably um, when we when we come to chant ourselves inevitably it's um, as it were a a European style rather than a Thai style. We don't have to. We haven't have to make it distinctively different. It's it is just inevitably different, just because of the, um, if you like, the way that we're constructed, the way that we're used to producing sounds. Where our response is inevitably distinguishable from um, when it's done by people in those native traditions. On the other hand, it may be also the case that we we may want to start to develop. Um, we may also want to develop something which is more distinctively um, our own. So we already have in the chanting book one piece which is where the, the chanting style, as it were, developed within Samatha rather than being learned from somewhere else. And um, others have tried um, uh, working on the, another sutta to, to, um, to try and do something similar there. So there may be grounds for um, some further creativity in the future, and I think I think it's important to see this as a a sort of ongoing process, really. Um, uh, and particularly in the way that the chanting is is taught. The, the other, perhaps the other anecdote that I'll mention is. Um, when I when I was first taught chanting systematically, this is by a, a Cambodian monk called Venerable Chandawana. You may, if you saw the last um, edition of the journal, there's an article about him there. And he was studying in in Manchester at the time, academically, um, but he was a very experienced and very senior monk, um, and he used to he lived in a um, a kind of tower block on the on the main campus, which was used for student residences, and I used to go to visit him there. And um, after a while, he he started to uh, he introduced the idea of teaching chanting. And he used to every week he would produce a little slip of paper in which he typed out very carefully um, a small piece of chant. It was all very, you know, this was in the days of typewriters, not not um, web processes where you could, you know, easily correct your mistakes. And bear in mind, this was, he was new to this country and it wasn't his, even his native script, never mind his native language. Um, but it was all beautifully prepared and all the little diacritical marks were drawn in by hand. And then he would get me to repeat, he would chant a bit and then get me to repeat and we'd go through in considerable, you know, some very considerable care and detail, just going through gradually, gradually, a little bit at a time, building it up and building it up. And then the critical bit was that at the end, uh, the, the sort of homework for the week was that I had to memorize it and then come back next week and, and repeat and so on. And uh, What I didn't realize at the time, but uh, in fact only really occurred to me quite recently is that um, for all his, for all his um, seniority and experience, this was probably the first time that he'd ever taught chanting to, uh, like that. In fact, it was probably the first time he'd ever taught, taught chanting as such to anybody because teaching chanting in a traditional context is not really what you do that's not how people learn chanting it doesn't work that way so you normally you just go along to the temple and you either as a monk or or as a lay person and you just listen to people chanting 
and you learn it that way. And so nowadays, of course, you can have a book and then you, you'll go away and, pra and you know, practice on your own. But you just do it by essentially by listening and picking it up that way. So the idea of actually teaching it was something new. So he'd, he'd kind of developed this technique and um, and then he you know he went on to I think I was a, the kind of guinea pig that he was trying out various things and then shortly after that he, he taught the to be so and, and a number of other um, chants more widely so the whole the whole idea of how to teach um, chanting in a in a part of the world where it's it's quite new is is very much a work in progress it's not a um, it really brings home to me the the idea of the, the um, you know that first the sutta that we chant uh, from the chanting books the Dhamma Chaka Sutta, Dhamma Chaka Pawatana Sutta. I mustn't miss out the most important bit. So the Buddha's first teaching, where he, as it says, sets in motion the wheel of Dhamma. So the whole idea is that this thing is in motion; it's turning all the time. So when we come to chant and other things, but anyway, since we're talking about chanting, we're also engaging in turning that wheel. And that's a work in progress. This is not a finished thing. We need to, there's, we need to always be looking for new ways to, to engage in it. What works, what works for us, what works here and now. So it's not something that's, it's not just a thing that's sort of handed on like a finished job from the past. We have to find some way of engaging with the, with the chanting that works for us now. And every time we come to chant, whether ourselves or in a group, we're contributing to that turning of the wheel. And this is, a, this is very much an ongoing work in progress. This, uh, some, some of you will, will remember um, another example. So the Venerable Chandawana was the sort of first, was the first person to produce, to, to give some sort of major input to Samatha on the sort of instruction of chanting. And um, the next uh, um, person to give a sort of major input was, was Achan Mahalau from, who some of you may know as a, now as a temple. In near Litchfield, um, and he came to to teach some chanting back at Green Street back in the the nineteen seventies, and he he at that time he was teaching a rather long and complicated chant called the Mahasamaya Sutta. And the giveaway was that, as well as bringing the text to the Mahasamaya Sutta, he also brought along text for another sutta just in case we finish learning the Mahasamaya Sutta before the end of the week. Now, in fact, learning the Mahasamaya Sutta took us several years of <laughs> intensive um, uh, practice and st st repeti you know, study and, and practice and more and more and more practice. So the idea that it was even remotely conceivable that we could complete this task in a week was, was completely wide of the mark. <laughs> it, was, it was just an impossibility because uh, and in a sense, there was a, a complete non, you know, from our point of view, we had no idea what we were letting ourselves in for, I think it's fair to say. And for much of the time, the, part of the reason why it took so long was that we couldn't actually hear what he was doing. It's quite a, because it's quite a complicated sound. So the first problem was actually to hear what, what he was doing, because the range of sounds that he was producing were quite outside our normal range of experience. And from his point of view, uh, as he put it rather nicely after a day or two, with a, with a big smile, he said, oh, I never imagined you could be so bad. Um, so there was just a complete, you know, mismatch of expectations. And gradually we had to sort of come together and, and, uh, and anyway, we, you know, kept at it and, and eventually it turned out. But it was, um, it was a very good example of trying to find a way of, you know, making this thing work. How should we do it in this part of the world with our experience and so on. What is the way to get this thing to work? And this is very much a work in progress. So we should think of this um, um, 
not just as something, as I said, not just something that we kind of receive as a fait accompli, but it's something that we need needs to be regenerated and completed. Uh, sorry, regenerated and, and, and taken forward. So we must think of it rolling forward. So this Dhamma wheel needs to, to roll forward as well as just coming up to the present time. And we need to work at ways of making it work. Anyway, with that in mind, um, I was wondering if you'd care to join me in a, a little experiment. Or So no, normally at this time we finish with some practice, by which we normally mean meditation practice. But this time I thought we might do something which is more oriented towards chanting. And one of the things which has become apparent over the recent months working with Zoom and so on is, is that Zoom has particular limitations as far as chanting is concerned. Principally because we can't do it all together. We can't get the sense of listening to each other and doing it in a group in that way. So you could say that part of the process of trying to keep this wheel turning is to actually find what works and what doesn't work with chanting vis-a-vis -vis Zoom. So what I'd like to do is to, to do a number of chants and some of which we, a couple of which we will all join in on but the others of which we will just listen to. And that actually gives us uh, another opportunity. So to just listen to the chant and see where that takes us. So to begin with, we can do, we can chant the ATP so, and we can all chant that together. But then we're going to do three chants, um, three or four actually, um, which we'll take rather differently. So I'm going to look, I'm going to need to find some, draw in some assistance for all of this, but I'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> Usual suspects be on the alert. Um, so after the to be so, we will, somebody will chant the Buddha Manglagata. And you remember, remember that Peter, I think, got us to do the Buddha Manglagata in his talk. So instead of joining in the chant, for this one, um, it's a good opportunity to focus on the visualization. So if you remember, this particular chant um, describes the Buddha seated in the center, and then the eight chief disciples um, seated roundabout in the eight directions. So while the chanting is is going on while well, we can hear this chant going on we may like to just focus a little bit on that and just try and just be aware of that just try and build up that visualization so in the chanting book um, page nine of the chanting book is rather nicely set up so on the at the top of the page you have and you don't know you don't necessarily need to follow these in the in, in many ways when you're listening to these you may it may be better just to listen to it rather than following it but whatever whatever you find helpful but so page nine of the chanting book starts with setting up this visualization this mandala if you like with the buddha in the middle and the disciples around about and then at the bottom of the page there's the 28 buddhas so that takes all the buddhas 28 buddhas of which the historical buddha is just the most recent so all the buddhas going way way back so we'll then have the 28 buddhas and you can just try and get a sense of this way, way, this recession going way, way back. Now during this, I, uh, and I think the whole exercise will probably take about 20, 25 minutes. 
and so you might like to sit, find to sit in the chair or you might like to sit as you normally sit in practice however whatever you find, find comfortable and then for the third chant um, Richard will be pleased to hear we'll do the we'll do the the fire sitter the Aditya Pariyai sitter now that one's a little bit longer and in a way in one way encapsulates and expresses in a different way the the notion of dependent origination because in the first half of the sutta everything is described as being on fire all the objects all the five senses and the sense of the mind and all the objects and the consciousness associated are all on fire with greed and hate and delusion so this sutta was given to a a group of fire of fire worshippers and so he, this is why the Buddha expressed it in this way so that's the first half but then in the second half of the sutta um, it describes how the practitioner turns away from that and becomes uh, becomes free from all that so the first half of the sutta is characterized by the word adita everything is on fire adita adita whereas the second half is characterized by the word nibindati, so this turning away, this letting go, dispassion, leading to freedom. So that's the second half of the diagram that we had last week about the, about the dependent origination. The first half is very much to do with the conditioned going round, and the second half is more to do with the line that went led upwards. And this is very much at the heart of The heart of the teaching of the Buddha and when when we're listening to this maybe if you think of the idea of the essence of the Buddha's teaching being chanted not just now but yesterday and the day before and the year before and in so many different places this country other countries going way way back sometimes the chanting just the, the stream of sound not, never mind listening to the particular words but just let the sense of the sound have a sense of taking you back to some sort of source way way back and see if you can get a sense of the chant leading you back and see how you see how that works for you Okay. Then after that, we'll do the imasming, and you can listen to that however you like. And lastly, we'll finish with the bhajangas. Okay. So, first of all, if you just like to get in whatever position you want if you want to, if you're happy sitting in your chair, that's fine. Or if you want to sit on the floor, as you would sit for chanting or practice, whatever. Good. So, Rachel, could we begin with the it to be so, please? Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhuta sana Mota subhagavato arahato samma samma Iti <laughs> No son of Bodo Bagawati. 
Sopatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Chupatipano Bhagavato Savaka Nyaya Paripano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Samichi Patipano Savaka Sango Yati Dung Chattare Porisa Yoga Niata Porisa Pogala Hesa Savaka Sango Honeo Pahoneo Dakine Mangalagatayo Panamase Sambudo di Padang Saito Nesino Chewa Marjime Kandanyo Pobaba Kecha Sari putto chatakine parati palicha panchime picha ananda paya pe chakawampati Magala no cha utare Isane pichakrahulo Ime komangala buddha Sabe itapati tita Wandita te cha amehi Sakare hi cha pujita E te sanganu bawena Sabasoti bawantunu in che Saranang Karang Muning 
Vande di pankarang jinang name vande kondanya satarang vande mang galanaya kang vande sumana sambundang vande re watanaya kang vande sorbita sambundang anormada sing muning name vande paduma sambundang vande narada naya kang padramutarang muning vande Vande Sumeda Naya Kang Vande Sujata Sambudhang Piyada Sing Muning Name Atta Da Sing Muning Vande Dhamma Da Sing Jinang Name Vande Siddhatta Sat Tarang Vande Tissamaha Muning Vande Pusamaha Virang Vande Vipassinaya Kang Sikhing Maha Muning Vande Vande Vesabhutnaya Kang Kakusandang Muning Vande Vande Kona Gamanang jinang kasapang sugatang vande vande gotamanaya kang atavi satime bundha nibbana matadaya ka namete sirasa nichang te mangrakam tu Sambada Yewame Sutang Ekang Samayang Bhagawa Gaya Yang Viharati Gaya Sise Sanding Bhikkhu Sahase Natatrako Bhakyawa Bhikkhu Amande Sisambang Bhikkhawe Adittang Kinjapi Kawe sambang aditang chakung bhi kawe aditang rupa adita chakko vinyanang aditang chakko sambhaso adito yam bhidang chakko sambhasa pachaya om banjati vedayitang sukang vado Ang wa adukka masukang wa tam di aditang gina aditang aditang rangang gina dosa gina mohag gina aditang jati ajara marane na soke hi paride we hi doke hi do manase hi upaya se hi adit tam di wadami so tang adit Tang sanda adita sota vinyanang aditang sota sambhaso adito yam bidang sota sambhasa pachaya oppanjati vediyitang sukang wa. Dukkang wa adukka masukang wa tam di aditang gina aditang aditang rangang gina dosang gina mohang gina aditang jati ajara marane na soke hi paride we hi dukke hi do manase hi upaya se hi aditang tiwadami kanang. Aditang gandha, aditang gana vinyanang, aditang gana sampasso, adito yampidang gana sampasso, pachaya umbanjati vediyitang sukang vadukkang vadukkam asukang vatambi aditang gena aditang aditang rangang gena mo sanggena mo hanggena adit. 
Tam jati ajara marane nasoke hi paride we hi doke hi do manase hi upaya se hi aditan divada mi jiva adita rasa adita jiva vimyanam aditan jiva sampasso adito yam pidam Jiva sampasa pachaya om panjati vede yitang sukang wa dukkang wa adukkama sukang wa tampi adittang kena adittang adittang ragangina dosangina mohangina adittang jati ajara marane naso Kehi paride we hi do ke hi do mana se hi upaya se hi aditan diwada mikayo adito po tamba adita kaya winyanang aditan kaya sampaso adito yam bidang kaya sampas. Sapacaya umpan jati we de yitang sukang wadu. Kang wa aduk kama sukang wa tampi adi tang gina adi tang adi tang ranga gina do sagina mo hagina adi tang jati ajara marane na soke hi paride we hi do ke hi do mana se hi upaya se hi adi tang diwadami mano adi Tu dhamma adita mano vinyanang aditang mano sampasso adito. Yam bidang mano sampasso pachaya upanjati vede yitang sukang vadukkang vadukkama sukang vatampi adittang kena adittang. Tang adi tang raga gina do sangina mo hagina adi tang jati ajara marane na soke hi paride we hi do ke hi do mana se hi upaya se hi adi tang tiwata ni E wam pasang bhikkave sutava ariyasa vako chakku saming pinid vindati rupe su pinid vindati chakku vinyane pinid vindati chakku sambhase pinid vindati yampidang chakku sambhase pachaya oppanjati veda itam sukam vadu Sukang wa adukka masukang wa tasaming pinip bindati so tasaming pinip bindati sande su pinip bindati so to winyane pinip bindati so to sambase pinip bindati ampidang. So to sambase pachaya opanjati vede yitang sukang waduk. Kang wa adukka masukang wa ta saming pinip binda tinga na saming pinip binda tinga nte su pinip binda tinga na winyane pinip binda tinga na sampase pinip binda tiyam pidang ka na sampase pachaya opan jati wede itang sukang waduk. Ang wa adukka masukang wa ta saming pinit binda ti chi wa ya pinit binda ti rase su pinit binda ti chi wa winyane pinit binda ti chi wa sampase pinit binda ti yam bidang chi wa sampase pachaya oppan jati vede yitang sukang wa adukka. Sukang wa adukka masukang wa ta saming pinip binda ti kaya saming pinip binda ti potambe su pinip binda ti kaya winyane pinip binda ti kaya sampase pinip binda ti ambirang kaya sampase pachaya upanjati vede itang sukang wa adukka 
ขังวะอาดุกมาสุขังวะทัสมิงปินิปปินนติมานัสมิงปินิปปินนติธรรมเมสุปินิปปินนติมานวิญญาณีปินิปปินนติมานุสัมปัสสิปินิปปินนติยัมปิดังมานุสัมปัสสะปัจจายาอปัญญติเวเดยิตังสุขังวาดุขังวาอาดุขมาสุขังวาทัสมิงปินิปปินนตินิปปินดังวิรัญญติวิรากาวิมุจจติวิมุตัสมิงวิมุตตมิทินยาณังโหติกีนาจาติวุสิตังบรัมมจริยังกตังกาเรนียังนาบารังอิตตะตายาติปจานาติติอินามวัจภะกวะอัตตมนาเทพิกุภะกวะโตภาสิตังอภินันดุงอิมัสสัมิงจปานวิยาการนัสสัมิงปัญญามาเนตัสสบิกุสหัสสัสอนุปาดายาสเวหิจิตตานิวิมุจิงสุอีมิงกาจะเสมานเกเทสัมันตาสัตยโยจันสัตสหัสสานิพุทธจัลปาริเตเตรักขันตุสุรักขันตุเอมัสมิงราจัสเซมานาเกเตสัมันตัสตตโยจันสัตสหัสสานิธรรมะจัลปาริเกเตรักขันตุสุรักขันตุเอมัสมิงราจัสเซมานาเกเตสัมันตัสัตโยจันสัตสหัสสานิอาเจกาบุตรจัลปาริเกเตรักขันตุสุรักขันตุเอมัสมิงจารปราจัสเซมานาเกเตสัมันตัสตโยจันสัตสหัสสานิสังกาจัลปาริเกเตรักขันตุสุรักขันตุโอชังโอสัตติสังขัตุดัมมานังวิจัยโยทัตานวิริยัมพิทิปังสัตติบุจังกาชาตาทาภาเรสัมมาดุเพกะบุจังกาสัมเทเทสัมบดันสีนาบุนีนาสัมมาดังกาตาบาวิตาบาหุลีกาตาสังวัตันติอาบินยายานิบบานายาชาบุดีอาเอทินัสัญชวันเจนาสุทิเทโหตุสัมมาดาเอกัสมิงสมัยนัตโตโมกัลลานัญชะคัมสัพพิลาเนดุอุคิเตดิสวะบุจังเอสังทัดเอสัยเอชะตังอาบินันเดตตัวโรกามุจิงสุธรรมทานเอเอทินัสัญชาวันเจนาสุติเทโหตุสัมมาตา
Ekadadamarajapi Gelanye Nabi Pilito Chundante Rena Tanjewa Anapitwana Sandaram Ekadadamarajapi Gelanye Nabi Pilito Chundante Rena Tanjewa Anapitwana Sandaram Samurditwa cha abada tamha wuta sita nasu ete na sancha wanjena soti te ho tu sabada ahina te cha abada Nanam Pimahe Sina Manga Hatakile Sawa Pantanu Pantti Dhammatang Etena Sancha Vajena Sotite to Sambhata. So, thank you for joining in on that uh, experiment to attempt to turn the wheel. So anyway, whenever we're chanting, next time we chant the ATP so, whether it's on your by yourself or in a group. And you can think of that as contributing in some way to that uh, that turning of the wheel. That that's something that matters. Anyway, enough of that. Um, I think over to you now. Yeah.